This is the chapter 18 lecture outline. Uh, this chapter is going to deal with air pressure and wind. Uh, because of the uneven split of the content in this chapter based on the schedule, uh, this uh, lecture outline will not be split into two videos. We'll just do one video for chapter 18. All right, so just to review atmospheric pressure, this is, again, the force exerted by the weight of air uh, above a certain location on Earth. So the weight of, of the air at sea level would be about 14.7 pounds per square inch and one kilogram per square centimeter. And this pressure decreases with altitude and we have several different units to measure the, the pressure. Uh, the typical weather unit we would use would be the millibar. So the standard level pressure is 1013.2 millibars or the old an old way of measuring which was using inches of mercury and the standard sea level pressure is 29.92 inches of mercury. Uh, again, this is a nice picture to indicate how air pressure works. So if you were standing underneath that column of air, the entire pressure that you would experience would be the force of the weight of all that air above you uh, exerted on uh, what would be the, the, the surface area of the bottom of that rectangular cube. So it's the force per unit area, again, of all the, the total air weight of, weight of air above you uh, focused on this, the surface area of a single location. So some instruments to measuring air pressure. Uh, the first uh, barometer, so this is a, a pressure measuring device, was invented by Torricelli in 1643, and it uses a glass tube filled with mercury. So when I gave it the unit of inches of mercury, this was literally a device that uh, would measure the height of a mercury column. Uh, in a vacuum to measure the air pressure. There's another type called an aneroid barometer and this is a, a barometer that uses no liquid. It just uses an expanding air chamber. And then the last type is a barograph which continuously records the air pressure, sort of like a seismograph continuously records uh, earthquake waves. This is just a picture of a uh, aneroid barometer and how that would work. It basically would change the expanding uh, air chamber which would change the, the levers that are pictured in this diagram to indicate a change in air pressure and this is a uh, bar graph just showing you that it will continuously record the air pressure in millibars. All right, wind. So wind is simply the horizontal movement of air parallel to the Earth's surface. Now wind always moves out of areas of high pressure towards and into areas of low pressure. And the mechanism that controls wind is called the pressure gradient force. Now, just like we were given uh, isotherms on weather maps to indicate the changing temperature over geographic regions, we have isobars on weather maps which are lines of equal air pressure. And the pressure gradient is simply the pressure change over a distance. So here is a picture, a typical pressure map showing areas of an area of high pressure and an area of low pressure. And all other pressures that are equal are indicated by these blue iso, uh, isobars. All right? And remember, the wind is always going to point out of high pressure areas, so the wind direction would be such that the wind directions would pass perpendicular through these isobars, and they would point towards these low press, this low pressure area in this diagram. So different controls of the wind. Uh, one effect is called the Coriolis effect. This is the apparent deflection of wind due to the Earth's rotation. And the deflection is to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. And we also have friction. But this is only really important near the Earth's surface. And it, the act is to basically slow the air's movement. And any time we talk about frictional forces, it's always resisting the motion of something. So friction would resist the, uh, the, the motion of the wind. So this is a picture of the Coriolis force. So imagine if you were standing at the North Pole and you were a really tall person, 100 meters tall, and you were to throw a baseball. Because of the rotation of the Earth, the actual trajectory of that ball would be this curved line that you see here. All right, Because of the, the rotation of the Earth would cause the actual continents to be moving around as the ball went into its trajectory. So this is the apparent deflection of... Uh, anything that moves with respect to the rotation of the Earth. Uh, so upper air winds, so these generally blow parallel to isobars, and these are called geostrophic winds. And the lack of friction with these uh, upper air winds allow for higher speeds. And we call a specific uh, um, direction of winds called the jet stream, and this is a river of air at a very high altitude, and these tend to move very quickly at high velocities, somewhere in the range of 120 to 240 kilometers per hour. 
Um, the next few slides are just some pictures of how uh, low and high pressures are related to the Coriolis effect, the wind direction, and the pressure gradient force. Um, I'm not super concerned with um, you memorizing or knowing exactly how all of these directions are related to one another. Just know that the Coriolis effect uh, affects the wind's direction and the pressure gradient force is why the wind is even existing to begin with. So it's because of these areas of high and low pressure, the fact that we have a changing pressure which is creating this pressure gradient force which is then creating the wind and the Coriolis effect can sometimes help the wind and friction forces can sometimes, will always actually go against the wind slowing, slowing, slowing uh, air that's moving along near the surface. Higher winds are less affected by friction but winds near the surface of the earth are very much affected by friction. Okay, cyclones and anticyclones. So cyclones, they're associated with rising air, and these are centers of low pressure. So these often bring clouds and precipitation, and think about it. From chapter 17, we said when air rises and it cools, we were going to have clouds forming, and we were going to have precipitation. So in a cyclone, if we have rising air, that's going to be where we're going to form clouds. So cyclones are always... Um, uh, usually uh, around when you have some type of precipitation or stormy uh, bad weather. An anticyclone is the complete opposite. This is associated with sinking air and these would be considered areas of high pressure. So that means pressure increases towards the center of anticyclones. Now here's a nice picture to illustrate that. Where you have a low, you're going to have what looks like counterclockwise wind directions and with an anticyclone you have clockwise wind directions and you would have uh, air that falls for high pressures so the air is going to sink so you typically associate high pressure systems with fair sunny weather and where you have rising air you have a low pressure and you typically have stormy uh, weather and lots of overcast clouds when you have a low pressure. So more about a cyclone. Center of low pressure, the pressure decreases towards the center, and the winds associated with the cyclone are counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. Uh, but in the southern hemisphere, it's actually the opposite. It's a clockwise. But I'm going to be mostly concerned with you knowing what's going on in the United States, which is in the northern hemisphere. So for a cyclone in our area, they would move counterclockwise. An anticyclone. In the northern hemisphere, they're going to move clockwise, and these are associated with subsiding air or fair weather. So airflow associated with surface cyclones and anticyclones. So again, for a high pressure, you have diverging surface winds, meaning the winds are going away from high pressures, and we have converging winds at low pressures, which means the wind is always going towards those pressures. Now the pressure, uh, this happens in two dimensions, not just two, not, or happens in three dimensions, not just two dimensions. So the air for high pressure always comes down, so the air entering a high or anti-cyclone, you're going to always have associate, uh, clockwise rotations. For a, a low where you have rising air, you're always going to be uh, associating counterclockwise uh, rotating wind with uh, those. All right, so general atmospheric circulation. So the underlying cause of just air circulating on the planet is, is basically due to unequal surface heating. So this is really due to the sun. Uh, the sun heats up different parts of the earth at different temperatures, and because of those temperature differences, we have pressure differences. And then because of those pressure differences, we have atmospheric circulation that always happens. So storms and uh, low pressure systems, uh, high pressure systems, they're very hard to predict ahead of time, but we do have some generalized circulations that happen on the earth that are always very predictable. So on the rotating earth there are three pairs of atmospheric cells that redistribute this heat. One is called the equatorial low pressure zone, so there's a lot of rising air at the equator, so there's always a, abundant precipitation, and we call those regions the tropics for a reason. Then we have the subtropical high pressure zone, so this is an area of stable dry air near 30 degrees in latitude and this is the location of the largest deserts on the planet and we also have trade and westerly winds in this region. We have the subpolar low pressure zone. This is where warm and cool winds interact and we essentially have polar fronts and this is another area where we have a lot of storms because it's a low pressure. And then finally we have the polar high pressure zone. This is cold subsiding air where we have polar easterly winds uh, and always typically have polar fronts at these locations. And this is a picture of that globalized uh, air circulation. So you have equatorial lows and then we have our subtropical highs, and you'll notice that you have the subtropical highs, you have 
the circulation air going down towards the surface, so we have a high pressure here, and then as it moves towards the equator, you have rising air, we have equatorial O, and then we have two more of these same cells. So we have a main cell that's over the the polar region of the Earth, and then we have the subtropical region, and that's where we are. We're in the subtropical region, and then finally we have the tropical region with this hair, air cell. So above the equator, there's three main, we would call these convection zones, and there's three zones below the equator. And make sure you know where the westerlies are, the northeast, northeast trade winds, the polar easterlies. Just make sure you understand what directions they're moving. All right, so how do the continents influence atmospheric circulation? So we have seasonal temperature differences that disrupt the global pressure patterns and the global wind patterns. The influence is most obvious in the northern hemisphere because that's where most of the land masses exist on the planet. Uh, we do have a monsoon season that occurs over certain continents. So during warm months, air flows onto land and warm, moist air uh, comes from the ocean. In the winter months, the air flows off the land and when we have dry continental air. So certain areas of the planet experience very warm months where we would have a lot of precipitation and very cool dry months where they experience almost no precipitation. So this is just the average surface air pressure in the month of January showing you where you would have uh, relative uh, locations of highs and lows on the planet. And this is the same sort of plot but now during summer. So you're going to see that the highs change locations and then certain places are always in a general low pressure zone where this would be the location where they would have more precipitation during these, uh, during these summer months. All right, the westerlies, these are in the subtropical region, these are mid-latitudes, and this is airflow that's interrupted by cyclones. So these are just air that's interrupted by low pressure zones. So cells always move west to east in the northern hemisphere, and we always have anticyclonic and cyclonic flow happening in this region. And the paths of the cyclones and anticyclones are associated with the upper level airflow, which I mentioned earlier called the jet stream. So the jet stream moves from west to the east, so that's going to be the direction of anticyclonic and cyclonic iconic flow and think about it all of our weather when it comes to Pennsylvania for example it always starts at the western part of the United States and comes eastward sometimes it'll come from the north some and that'll be a cooler uh, weather system sometimes it comes from the south and that'll be a warmer system so it always moves west to east so our weather always comes from the west so it's you can more easily try to predict the weather that's going to happen in our area all right, so some local winds. If you've ever been to the ocean, and I know a lot of people from Pennsylvania go to the New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia shores during the summer months, you may have uh, come across land and sea breezes. So because water, the air above water is typically cooler than, than land, during the day when the hand, land is really hot and the water is really cool, we have a, a localized high pressure forming over the water. So if you're ever on a beach during the day, it always feels like there's a breeze blowing at your face. That's because there's always a wind coming from the ocean blowing inland. The opposite occurs at night. Because water has a very high specific heat, it is warm during the day. So at night and cool summer nights, it's cool on land and warmer over water. So you would always feel a breeze to be on your back if you're facing the ocean during the nighttime on certain days. There's also such things as mountain and valley breezes and Chinook and Santa Ana winds, and these are uh, explained in detail in the chapter, so make sure that you look over those. All right, how do you measure wind? There's two basic things that we're concerned when we're looking at uh, measuring wind. It's direction and it's speed. So it's direction. Winds are labeled from where they originate. So for example, a north wind actually blows towards the south because the wind is coming from the north. So we always label winds from where they originate. The instrument for measuring wind direction is the wind vane. All right, so the direction is either indicated by compass points, so you could just say a northwest or a northeasterly wind, or you can just use from uh, an angle scale of 0 to 360 degrees. The prevailing wind comes more often from one direction. So you can have winds slightly changing at a location during the day, but there's always a prevailing wind, and this is just the strongest wind direction that is recorded on any particular day. The speed of wind is often measured with something called a cup anemometer. So essentially the cup anemometer just spins in the wind and then based upon the rotation speed of that apparatus, you're able to tell what the, the speed of the wind is causing that to rotate. So what uh, can affect the wind direction? Uh, so winds are associated again with cyclones, which are low, low pressure zones, and anticyclones, high areas of high pressure, and they often bring changes to temperature and moisture conditions. So there's two topics 
uh, that end chapter 18, and they are the topics of El Nino and La Nina. And everyone knows that El Nino is Spanish for the Nino. I'm just kidding. If you know what that reference is, it's from a Saturday Night Live skit with Chris Farley. Feel free to Google that and YouTube it, but I'm not going to put that on here because it might be slightly inappropriate for a science course. But anyway, El Nino is a countercurrent that flows southward along the coast of Ecuador and Peru. So these, uh, these flows are typically associated with warm air, and they usually appear during the Christmas season, and they block upwelling of colder nutrient-filled water, and anchovies end up starving from the lack of food in the oceans in this region. The strongest El Nino events on record occurred during the years 1982 to 83, and then 1997 and 1998. And in the 1997 and 98 event caused heavy rains in Ecuador and Peru, and then ferocious storms in California. And that Saturday Night Live skit I mentioned was around during this time in the 90s. Uh, so El Nino is related to large-scale atmospheric circulation. So there's something called the Southern Oscillation. This is pressure change between the eastern and western Pacific. So changes in the trade winds create a major change in the equatorial current system with warm water flowing eastward as opposed to flowing westward. So here's a great picture of what we're talking about. So on the western side of the Pacific we have very high pressures and on the eastern side we have very low pressures. So this creates a pressure gradient changing from high to low so we have trade winds that are being pushed easterly instead of westerly and what this causes is this low pressure to move towards the coast of this region of the planet which is the western coast of South America and the western coast of the United States causing these uh, very strong storms to occur during El Nino events. Uh, so the effects are highly variable, but depending on the, the temperatures and the size of the warm water pool. So every year is a little bit different with El Nino, but certain years are worse than others. Um, the opposite of El Nino is called La Nina, uh, and I believe El Nino actually means the baby, and Nino is male baby, and La Nina would be the female baby, I think. Don't quote me on that. I don't speak Spanish, but... I'll probably look that up after this video to make sure I'm right, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. So La Nina is opposite of El Nino, and it's triggered by colder than average surface temperatures in the eastern Pacific. So it's the complete opposite. So it's when you have a high pressure on the western side of the United States and South America, and then a low pressure in the western part of the Pacific, creating uh, strong equatorial currents going to the west. So we have an increase in trade winds to the west, and that'll cause warmer, wetter weather and low pressure areas in the Australia, East Asia region. And we'll have cooler, drier air in the western regions of South America and North America. So events associated with El Nino and La Nina are, are understood to have a significant influence on the state of weather and climate really almost everywhere. There's been data taken to show that every region on Earth is affected by strong El Nino and La Nina weather patterns. So the last bit of this chapter is about the global distribution of precipitation. So it's relatively complex to figure out what areas of the world get more precipitation than others, but it's related to the global wind and pressure patterns. So high pressure regions where you have subsiding air, divergent winds, and dry conditions have less precipitation, and areas of low pressure have ascending air, converging winds, and very mu a lot of precipitation, specifically along the equator near Amazon and Congo basins in South America and Africa respectively. So here's a picture of global distribution of precipitation depending on region, and you'll see that the areas of large precipitation tend to be along areas of low pressure, and low precipitation areas are places along where you have high pressure. So it's also related to the distribution of land and water. So large land masses in the middle latitudes often has left, have less precipitation towards their centers. So the center of land masses in the northern hemisphere tend to have less precipitation than the areas near uh, coastal regions. And mountain barriers also alter precipitation patterns where the westward slopes receive abundant rainfall. So that would be the west side of the United States. So think of the Sierra, Sierra Nevada mountains of California in that area westward. They get a lot of rain certain times of the year. And then leeward slopes are usually deficient in moisture. So think of the Rocky Mountains to the east, Denver, uh, the Plain States, the Western Plain States. They don't get a lot of precipitation at certain times of the year. That's because they're on leeward slopes.